It's time for Dog Talk, and we go across the board and welcome. Tell us who you are. I am Dr. Eric Seward. He is Dr. Eric Seward, <laughs> and he has braved the elements to come out this morning. Uh, take a quick opportunity and tell you Rochester, Eastern, Pulaski, and Valley are all on two-hour delays. His kids and the Manitou Training Center as well. All right, uh, you told us off the air we're talking about prenatal care. I, I am, and I, I'm also wondering um, how many, I, I wish they kept stats on the hours missed each year of school. And I would like to know how this year compares to past years, because it sure seems like between the cold snap and, <laughs> I mean, I, I would say there have been more two-hour delays than not. Uh, and I've got I've got kids in both Rochester and Peru schools, and it's been the same. It's almost been identical. Yeah. Um, there there may be one or two exceptions, but it's um, you know when one's on a two-hour delay, the other usually is. And I mean the weather patterns aren't too different here. They're both kind of rural. As the guy who uh, gets up and comes to work and tells everybody else to stay home. Um, <laughs> It seems like there's more this year, but I don't know. Because a lot of years, yeah. you know, we may have only one or two snow days, but a lot of fog days. Yeah. You know, in the spring and the fall especially. Uh, but it seems like it seems like you're right. It seems like there's more. It's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm calling for a, a statistician to keep these for, for future <laughs> future generations. We always talk about the, you know, the great blizzard of 78 yeah. or, or yeah. whatever. And well, I, it's, it's coming yeah. to an end, though, with all the e-learning stuff that they yeah. have. I mean, you know, we're getting degrees now online, so it's it's right. only a matter of time before that goes away. <laughs> that could be, yeah. Who needs schools at all, right? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> Let's not make that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, yeah, I did want to talk about prenatal care. Um, and this is circling back around to topics that we've covered in the past and in bits and pieces of it. And we started this last week and kind of um, got side railed a little bit talking about Victor Oladipo. <laughs> but... Um, which he had a successful surgery, I, I hear, and, and that's all good. So that's my only wrap up on, on, on the Pacers. They seem okay. to be winning without him, so that's good. Um, that said, um, right down the uh, right down the the alley for for what I do um, is this talk about prenatal care, and I, I just wanted to talk about sort of general prenatal care. We kind of got into pregnancy tests a little bit last time, um, and just sort of the beginning game, and just as a rehash, over the counter pregnancy tests are very good. In fact, they're identical to the ones we use in the office for just uh, qualitative checking. We oftentimes will do um, quantitative testing when we're not sure about things, um, and we compare that to ultrasounds. And just for a, and this isn't routine prenatal care, but it does come up often when somebody comes in early and we don't know if it's a viable pregnancy. Um, a lot of times we may do some serial checks of what we call quantitative HCGs. HCG stands for human chorion chorionic gonadotropin, which is the pregnancy hormone essentially. And that that is something that you can test with a qualitative test, the P on the stick, yes, no uh, kind of test, or you can get a number associated with it. Uh, the numbers in, in like hospital grade labs are gonna start at right around five or five to 10 are gonna be positive. And then they double about every 20, uh, about every 36 to 48 hours after that, up until about nine or 10 weeks where they peak out and they go from five, which I, I always, you know, if I'm relating it to something is like a, a, a Big Mac uh, to about 120,000, which is like a, you know, an average size home, you know, if, you, if you're thinking of it in terms of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so your pregnancy goes from a Big Mac to an average size home, and then it falls back down and plateaus somewhere in the 15 to 20,000 range typically. And so you can use that pattern sort of to establish where are we in the pregnancy. Um, just to make sure that our listeners understand that yeah. that was an analogy. It was an analogy, yes, it We're was. We're yes. talking about <laughs> jumping from the price and, of a Big Mac to the price and, of a home in terms of what it's going to cost you yeah, to pregnant. No, I mean, well, saying, oh, it's, it's going to cost way more than that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Fact, <laughs> let's let's after, not kid ourselves. After 20 years, you'll understand it. <laughs> yeah. But the um, you're talking about the hormonal level, just right? sort of the just sort of the idea of the of the numbers involved and and how how dramatically they shift. Um, 
And if you think about what's happening in egg and a sperm are meeting, they're, they're implanting in the lining of the uterus. When they make contact with the maternal uh, bloodstream, then HCG starts to go out into the maternal bloodstream. That's when you can first register it on a test. Our tests nowadays are very accurate, usually around the time of a missed period. Uh, those start to pop up positive if if all of the timing is sort of perfectly average. Right. So if people are having 28-day cycles or ovulating on day 14, then you know right around the time that they would have, have started that next period, you're going to have a positive pregnancy test. Um, there's dangers in that. Um, one of the problems nowadays is that everybody's finding out they're pregnant the second that they can. And uh, almost everybody comes in and says, I took four pregnancy tests and they were all positive. And I'm here to declare to the all of radio land that you only need to take one. <laughs> one positive is positive. You don't need to take four. Um, if it's negative, then you may have a timing issue and you may want to wait a week and try another one. Um, but with that in mind, you know, it's a positive is a positive. They're, they're very sensitive tests. They're very accurate. And, so you're not going to take four and get two of one and two of the other? No, 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 no. Yeah, and, and the false positive rates are, are very low and right. very strange. Um, false negative rates are oftentimes timing related. And that might be just sort of human error or not knowing exactly when ovulation happened. Once you get that positive pregnancy test, um, from that point forward, if you get that very early positive pregnancy test, there's about a 50-50 chance of that pregnancy developing. And this is one of the things that's hard to kind of get through to, to people that have that early pregnancy test um, because I think once you get a positive pre PM of six, you a positive pregnancy test, people get babies in their minds, and that's that. And I, I think that pretty much is across the board. I don't, I don't think anybody, regardless of your circumstances, has that positive pregnancy test and, and doesn't have that little poof baby thought. And, and then if it doesn't go forward, it becomes sort of one of those, those sort of devastating things that happens to people. In the old days, if you were to rewind to 1960 or 70, um, those pee on the stick tests weren't commercially available like they are now. They weren't nearly as accurate. Uh, so you weren't finding out you were pregnant until much later. A lot of these things that turn out to be miscarriages, we would have just written off as, well, that was a funky period. And, or, boy, I missed my last period, but I had a doozy the next time. And then that was that, and nobody knew. You know, nobody was any the wiser. Um, once that positive pregnancy test happens, the typical course then is people call the office. They come in, and I like personally I like to see people between like six and ten weeks. Um, we always talk in weeks. Everybody, aunts and neighbors and moms and, and grandmas, all talk in months. Um, it's sort of the the mile versus the the, the kilometer kind of kind of debate. Yeah. But um, again, a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but in in doctor terms, we talk in weeks because it's more accurate. It's more specific, more accurate. Months are vague. Um, every month is a little different. I If you're going to do the algebra on it, and this is what I tell my patients, think of two months as being about nine weeks because it's pretty close most mm -hmm. of the time, with the exception of, the, of this dumb month. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I think a lot of people think of a, mo a month as being four weeks, but really most months are four weeks and, and a half. And again, and, it just depends yeah. on how you think of it. A lot of people think yeah. of a month as uh, 30 days. Yeah, well, and on average, you, you get something like that. Yeah. But but that that said, you know, if you add it all up over the course of nine months, it's 40 weeks. 40 weeks is from the time of of your the beginning of your last period, assuming that all of the timing was averagely perfect. Yeah, and um, and so it what sounds I, like accuracy is the higher priority than preciseness. Well, in in, in our case, yes, because it makes a big it makes a big difference between um, when you allow a delivery to go forward or when you worry right. about preterm labor, things like that. Yeah, um, how when when we time some of the tests and things that we do, and. Um, we we talk in weeks, so you know weeks are the are sort of the standard for us. Now, going kind of going forward with that concept, it's a forty week process from that that date. Usually, we're seeing a, a heartbeat right around six to seven weeks. Um, that correlates usually with a um, five to fifteen, maybe twenty. 
thousand um, beta HCG um, level on the quantitative tests, and so that gives me a lot of information. Usually pretty early on, uh, a lot of times at the very first appointment when people come to see me, I'll put an ultrasound on and look and try to confirm, A, are we where we think we are, uh, set those dates, make sure there aren't two or three or four in there. Um, um, I've had uh, great stories. This could be a whole different topic someday, but great stories of saying, oh, wow, there are twins. My favorite was, and I've had, I've had, I've had women say, shut up, you know, or slap me or, you know, pinch me really hard. But my favorite was when I said there were two and the, the, the mom was like, oh, wow, that's cool. And I hear this thump in the background and the dad who was standing there had just <laughs> gone right over and, and uh, we're like smelling salts uh, <laughs> and I kept doing the ultrasound um, the the nice thing about doing an ultrasound though early is it, it A confirms that things are as they should be helps us, guide us with those dates um, so I would say about half the time we're resetting dates based on ultrasounds just because not everybody ovulates on day 14. Not everybody remembers the exact first day of their last period. You know, sometimes people are showing up after two or three months thinking, huh, you know, I, I should have been having periods and I haven't been. I don't know what's going on. Oh, my goodness, I'm pregnant. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then, then you're thinking back to, you know, November or October or something. And I, I think it was the 15th. Maybe it was the 12th. I don't know. Yeah. And um, and so we get a lot of that. You know, not everybody's monitoring precisely. And, and, and so the ultrasound helps either confirm those dates that we think or set new dates. And then we're kind of off to the races. So this is sort of the meat of the topic today. First thing we do is we get some labs. And usually early on we do an exam. Those labs are going to include things like blood count, a basic test for some of the diseases that affect pregnancy like hepatitis, HIV. Um, We look for uh, syphilis, even though that's very rare in this part of the world. We look for... um, uh, we look for in the antibodies for uh, herpes simplex. We we do a general blood count. We look to see if people have been immunized against rubella. Uh, rubella is something that that affects pregnancies, affects babies. Um, that those are pretty common. Um, a, a lot of places check thyroid um, because if you have a, a very low acting thyroid or a very hyper acting thyroid, that can affect pregnancies. Um, that's and these are all good good basic initial labs that's sort of the the main uh, set of labs that we do blood typing is important um, rh negative moms have a sort of a different track that we follow with regards to giving rogam later um is it that forms the baseline then for the rest of the pregnancy? It helps, yeah. It's this. It's the start. It's a baseline, and it also. I mean, some of those things, you know, we test them once, and if they're negative, fine. And uh, unless something weird happens, um, and the the state of Indiana wants us to test um, syphilis um, later in pregnancy, which is interesting because it's such a low incidence thing. But um, yeah, it yeah. has been for a long time. It has been for, but you know. Heroin was was a low incidence thing for a long time too, and that's not anymore. Um, But yeah, it's interesting. But that's in this. You know, I've I've done this in a few different states, and this is the only state that I've ever seen that in in that way. But they don't Um, test for any of the other. Not twice, no. Yeah, yeah. So, but but all of those things are pretty basic tests across the board. Um, and then moving forward, um, as we get into the the beginning of second trimester, which we consider to be about twelve weeks, uh, we start looking at some of the the screening things that you can do for. Um, aneuploidies like genetic problems, um, Down syndrome being the probably the classic example. And there are a few different versions of that. If people um, are low risk, uh, sometimes we'll do what's called a quad screen or a sequential screen. Um, a quad screen is, is basically testing for different pregnancy related proteins and you can make some assumption based on ratios of those. Um, a sequential screen is testing um, a, there's a there's a 
lab test you can do at about 11 or 12 weeks, followed up by that quad screen, and that gives you a little more information. Um, the best thing that you can do, but but right now it's not universally covered by insurance, so it's one of those things that you have to kind of pick out risks. Um, there's a, a whole set of tests that are called free cell fetal DNA tests. These are really awesome. They're, they're fun tests. Um, you draw blood from from mom and you can test for placental fragments in maternal blood uh, using a, a PCR which is a you know amplifying the actual DNA and they can pick out fetal DNA which is kind of interesting and you can you can test for all uh, not just down syndrome but a whole bunch of stuff and um, when we get those reports back they're they're really interesting and I've discovered all kinds of interesting things and for the most part um, it, it's a whole different debate about sensitivity and specificity but for the most part they've been right on so um, now at this stage of the game can you test for the stuff that we hear about like spina bifida or something where it, the child will be born with uh, severe physical problems. Sure, and and these things are are part of that. And there are some things that you can test for, and other things that, if if it's a genetic thing, a lot of times we can get information from those ratios. And there's a risk profile. It's, you know, an 18 year old isn't the same risk as a 48 year old. Um, Down syndrome is a great example. It's almost a linear, slightly up curve in the risk as you get older. So a, a 20 year old has a risk that's something akin to 1 in 1600 for Down syndrome. Um, a 35 year old it's about 1 in 300. We're a 28 year old age. Yeah, 28 years old it's about 1 in 800 ish. Um, and when you get out to 48 it's 1 in 12. And you know so you can kind of see this progressive uh, risk curve for for Down syndrome in particular. Um, what's interesting is even though there aren't very many there aren't many 48 year olds at all having babies um, that doesn't come up very often there's a whole bunch of 20 year olds and 25 year olds having babies they're low risk the majority of down center babies are happening in that age group because the numbers of babies are so much greater in those age right, groups. They're the ones that are having right. Babies. So we worry about now, it more as you get older. Because there was yeah. a time when you were in your 40s you were having your 6th or 7th kid and I mean you know, it, it, having babies and, and ages, uh, that's sort of uh, waxed and waned over the years. I think traditionally um, people had babies actually, or at least they started having babies earlier than they are at the moment. Um, I, I don't have that many teen pregnancies yeah, I guess now. That would be true. And I'm having more and more what we call advanced maternal age pregnancies, um, at least in this setting in Rochester, Indiana. Um, there are teen pregnancies right, still but, but it's just you know if i had to look at the composition of my particular uh, right. people that's it, they tend to be a little bit older set you don't have as many yeah. teen brides as they had back then not as many no and not as many brides in general yeah. <laughs> but um with that with that said then the kind of the next level is ultrasounding and so spina bifida interesting that quad screen was started with a single test which was called alpha fetal protein and alpha fetal protein is a protein in all babies. It tends to be in the abdomen and the spinal cord. And it was noted to be high in, in babies that had that had spina bifida. So that very original test was looking at spina bifida. It's still a way we use that. It's also good for placental problems and any anything that might be a leak in the system, you know, that's allowing this stuff to get into maternal blood where it isn't normally found. Um, ultrasounds are really, really good at looking for uh, spinal cord defects too. And so um, between those two things, and I usually do my ultrasounds at about the halfway point, so 18 to 20 weeks, um, looking for anatomical things. Um, putting the blood tests and the anatomical things together you can get a lot of information it's not perfect about half of all down syndrome babies have perfect ultrasounds um you know there's not any significant findings and when you look at those blood tests you know a blood test may say one in 50 risk well that's that's only two percent you know 98 percent of the time that's not the case um and those are those are also graded by age and so a lot of times um you know you may get a relatively lower risks uh test in somebody that's 20 
that may actually have that problem right. and vice versa so it's it, it, you know these these aren't perfect they're not yes no those uh, fetal fibronet or i'm sorry the um, free cell fetal dna tests are are um a little better you know i should say they're a lot better um and they they allow us to sometimes get away without doing more definitive testing like say amniocentesis that used to be done needle put in some fluid sucked out and you know that was that was the old-fashioned way we're mm-hmm. not doing that nearly as much it's certainly not in my kind of an office setting um are we doing that as often it still happens a little bit at the maternal fetal medicine places but but you know those are the higher risk people um and then as as things go along, we usually see everybody every four weeks up until about 28 weeks, which is the beginning of third trimester. That's a, a template. It changes if there are problems. Um, starting at 28 weeks, we see everybody two weeks up until about 36 weeks, and then every week until about 40 weeks. 40 weeks is our due date. I always point out to people that it's kind of like playing darts. Um, you know, you're always shooting for the bullseye. Hardly ever hit it. Um, I'm happy if you get it on the dartboard. The dartboard for me is 37 to 41 or 42 weeks. You know, let's get it on that dartboard and we're good. Um, we consider ourselves a level one nursery here, which means we don't take care of super preemie babies. And we kind of have a rough cutoff of 35 weeks. So if, if we see somebody's going to deliver before 35 weeks, we try to get them to where, uh, where there's a NICU. Um, but you know, in this setting, you know, normal pregnancies that get out there close to close to their due date on that dartboard somewhere, or even in the periphery, just a little, um, we usually we're, we're good with that. Um, starting at 28 weeks, we do the sugar testing, looking for diabetes. Um, there's a whole subset of diabetes which is called gestational diabetes, and gestational diabetes is a, a, a problem that happens about 15 percent of pregnancies and you know a fraction of those are going to require some intensive therapy and that when you hear about somebody having a 10 or 12 pound baby it's almost always a gestational diabetic mom um very very rarely is that a, a genetically driven thing it's almost always the, now when you say gestational you know, diabetes this means the mother's diabetic or the baby's diabetic i mean the, the, the mom's diabetic mom's and diabetic. and so what's happening is uh during pregnancy she's developing insulin resistance there's extra sugar floating around in her system the baby is seeing that sugar of like any of us if we eat too much sugar we get plump um well that happens with babies um pretty easily actually and uh and the other thing that happens is the baby to to deal with that sugar is making insulin of its own putting it away well the minute that baby comes out all of that that sugar is going to get socked away by the uh, high levels of insulin and all of a sudden you have this sudden drop in sugar levels big problem with with babies and diabetic uh scenarios and so our pediatricians are are constantly sort of monitoring that when babies are born um with with regards to how we manage it the better control we have over that heading down the home stretch the less likely those are going to be issues and of course we're monitoring for humongous babies and 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 vice versa if somebody has true diabetes if they come into pregnancy with diabetes sometimes the placenta is is dysfunctional enough that the baby doesn't grow very well and so just the opposite end you get you get small babies um also diabetics are are kind of famous whether you're an adult or a baby doesn't matter um for for peeing a lot you know that sugar messes with your kidneys and it pushes a lot of extra fluid through so you will get what's called um, polyhydramnios, which is an extra fluid, more more fluid than normal in the uterus, and so another thing to monitor for if you if you've got a diabetic mom, you see extra fluid. Um, that means the baby is seeing all this sugar and peeing off extra fluid. Um, most of those babies are not diabetic. Um, you know, they they usually pop out and and they're physiologically normal. They just need to get through that first few days so that their insulin levels and sugar levels are back in balance and then usually things it's it's sort of a matter of hours with babies usually um and then and then uh we also deal with the rogam issues the rh negative um issues um just in in real brief the the issue with that is most uh most people are are rh positive there are three what we call major histocompatibility uh proteins that live on blood cells there's a b 
I don't know why they skipped C, but they went straight to D. <laughs> and, and if you don't have any of those proteins, if you don't have A or B, we'll skip D for a second. If you don't have A or B, you have O. So we all either have O blood, A blood, B blood, or AB blood, um, because you get one from mom and one from dad. Most people are O. Um, most people have the D protein. D is kind of considered separate. That's what we call RH factor after Reese's monkeys. And it's either there or it's not. So you either have D or not. If you are O negative, you have no proteins. <laughs> if you are AB positive, you have all of them. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It's not a bad thing to be A or B or, or O. It's just a matter of if you were to be given a blood transfusion of the wrong kind of blood, you would react to that blood transfusion. If you are O negative, you can give blood to anybody because you're a universal donor because your blood has none of these proteins that will cre cause reaction. So kind of get the idea. Well, when moms are RH negative, we can make a 90% assumption that the, that the dad is RH positive, which means the baby has about a 50-50 shot of, well, it's got about a, well, it depends on if he's a heterozygote, meaning two two different genes or not, but there's a pretty good chance that somewhere between a 50-50 and, and higher that, that that baby is going to have um, an RH positive blood type. If a little bit of that RH positive blood gets out of that RH negative mom, the mom may, may produce an immune response. And that won't affect usually that first pregnancy, but then if she turns around and gets pregnant again, same scenario, tax the baby's blood and the baby becomes very anemic and you get all sorts of, of sequela to that um, sick babies. This was a huge problem in 1940, 1950 and before um, when people either didn't know what was going on or we didn't have adequate treatment. What we do now is anytime we have somebody with RH negative blood, we give them Rogam. Rogam is a, a binder. It basically goes in and it binds up any of that baby blood that might get out. And it lasts about 12 weeks. So we can give a shot. Lasts about 12 weeks. Um, we can test the baby when the baby's born. If it's RH negative, we don't worry about it. If it's RH positive, we usually give a second round of, of Rogam. And um, any time that a mom that's RH negative has a big bleed in pregnancy for some reason, we, we test the, the blood uh, to see if any RH positive baby blood has gotten into their system and we give them extra Rogam to kind of compensate for that. Um, but that's something that we routinely do in those patients right around 28, 29 weeks when we're doing those diabetic tests. We switch it over to every two weeks at that point. At about 36 weeks, we do a culture for something called um, beta strep or streptococcus. Everybody's heard of strep throat. I think of these things in terms of dogs. Again, I'm metaphorically speaking. Um, <laughs> the the um, if, if you if, if I said dog, you know, we would all have an, an idea of what a dog looks like, and we may all have three different views of what a dog looks like. Um, I might think of a poodle or a, a Pekingese, and you might think of a pit bull, and you might think of a golden retriever, and. Um, those are all different dogs. Yours might be a little scarier than mine. Um, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> but the, the idea is that with streptococcus, there are different versions of streptococcus. Beta strains tend to be skin contaminants. Most of us have them somewhere growing on us. They're just sort of bacteria that they, they don't hurt us. They don't cause disease almost ever. Alpha strains cause strep throat, they cause flesh heating, you know, uh, streptococcal infections, any of that like bad stuff associated with strep, that's, that's an alpha strain. We test for the beta strains because there's this interesting phenomenon about one fourth of women have beta strains growing somewhere around the birth canal. And babies every once in a while come out, suck this stuff in with that first big breath and get pneumonia. Um, it doesn't affect anybody people that have it you can't tell by looking at them it's not like a, i take you know extra showers every day or i don't take shower it doesn't matter you know it's really it doesn't follow any lines at all it's just there or it's not we test for it about 36 weeks if it's there we give people antibiotics when they come in and labor turns out the strep is very easy to kind of suppress um, but it grows right back the minute you take them off their antibiotics so you know we just give it uh, try to get a couple doses and when they're in labor and that usually solves that problem 
Um, it also g- it kind of gives a heads up to the pediatricians that if a baby's having a little trouble struggling breathing right after delivery and they've got positive beta strep, then the you know the the docs know to look for that. Um, and then we start seeing everybody every week. Usually it's in those final few weeks that, that all the excitement happens. Um, people are get fired up about, you know, birth plans and whether they're going to have epidurals or not and how, how much it's going to hurt and when can they have their baby and, oh, my goodness, I don't want to have my baby and <laughs> this is going to hurt and, and when can it happen. And, um, you know, and, and towards the end, usually people are feeling pretty uncomfortable and pretty ready and, and pretty scared and, you know, just lot of emotions and, mm-hmm. um, and so starting somewhere around 36 37 weeks my doctor brain stops thinking about what do I need to do to keep them pregnant and starts thinking about what I need to do to evict this child if I you know, if any is there a reason and, yeah. and all of those things and and um, that's kind of you know the time when most of the, the what I like to call the Hollywood part of pregnancy where you never see many Hollywood films where the pregnant woman isn't out to here and breaking her bag of water in public and all that of interest and it's just a side point that hardly ever happens Um, bags of water almost always are broken by yours truly (laughs) or somebody like me Um, they do once in a while and and when it does happen it's a good sign to come into the hospital um, and get ready to have a baby but but that said um, that's sort of prenatal care in a nutshell. All of that stuff, that's a template. All of that stuff is modifiable. Um, on average, I see somebody about 13 times through the course of a normal pregnancy um, and then once uh, postpartum. But sometimes I see people two or three times postpartum, high-risk people. I, I just delivered a baby a, a week ago or so that I, I saw her almost every week from... 10 weeks on just because of the nature of the pregnancy and um so you know it, it i i like to tell people that we we build these things as a global package it's one bill it doesn't matter if you see me 23 times you're getting a better deal and uh it's kind of kind of like a, a you know a check off coupon i guess um and and it makes it a situation where I get pretty close to my patients. You know, I, I get to know them pretty well over the course of, of a few a few pregnancies. I might I might see people twenty five thirty times. Yeah. You know, in a, in a span of, of three or four years, and be a part of, of two birthday parties, mm-hmm. and um, and that that's actually a lot of fun. You know, so most of the time my job is a blast when it comes to that. Prenatal care is a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's one of those things I think people out there that are thinking about getting pregnant want to know about. Um, people that have been pregnant probably wonder why we do what we do, and maybe, maybe that helps. I don't know. Well, if uh, they need to get a hold of you, any uh, mothers or mother wants to be, I'm at Woodlawn Hospital, um, and they can they can call over there to the uh, Woodlawn uh, Physicians uh, Practice, the uh, Woodlawn Medical Practice. I think is what it is the word wimps. I know that or WMP, <laughs> and um, I'm uh, I'm right in the hospital on the second floor. Um, we have a number of, of good folks that are delivering babies. Um, I'm the only OBGYN uh, in town, uh, but we've got some other good primary care people that are working uh, obstetrics, and we'll get we'll get you taken care of. Excellent. Thank you very kindly for your time, Doc. All right. You're welcome.